All right, we are now recording. Okay, and the first thing I'm gonna start out with is a quick little poll for everyone today. Um, it's just a, um, just a couple questions. Um, I have it going now. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, excellent. This is my first poll, <laughs> so I'm super excited. Oh, so I can't see my Vicki, there's no Wyoming option. I can't oh. sit at my poll. Oh, man. How did I miss Wyoming? I'm so sorry. But I'll tell you that I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So, Carl, we're, all we're, I will just... We're, we're last in the alphabet. All right. Yeah. But there's, well, there's, we, there's, there's it, three of us here, and that's a big proportion of the population. <laughs> well, and this is, we were focusing on Western states. So when we were creating this agenda, we listed these states. So I went back to my notes and instead of really thinking it through. So sorry for Trent, too. The next one should be okay, though. So let me, I need to take a quick little picture of this, just in case I don't get my results back. I, I trust technology only to a certain point. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to end the. Oh, all right. Going to. We only have half of us that have voted so far, but I suppose Lord, that. There are donuts in the room in honor of the hey. administrative profession. All right. Give me one Thank second. You. You know, I, I don't think I answered anything, and I just hit the close button, so I didn't go out. There. Okay. Um, I can relaunch oh, yeah. polling. Okay, see if that there does it. it. Got it. Yep, I got it. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay. Um, just a reminder, if you're not on mute, to please be on mute um, when uh, a speaker is speaking and then unmute to ask questions. Or again, like I said, we can, um, we will be recording this and you can type your questions in the chat as well. Okay. Oh, we just had another um, participant sign up. So we're still gathering people. I'm going to leave that poll up there. Okay. And Jill's in Wyoming as well. So. All right. Um. It's interesting too, you have David from Kansas, but he's in Oregon. So you might have to have an other there with the state stick. I was just seeing yes. that chat. Yeah. I'm learning, I'll get better at these guys. Alrighty, okay. I am gonna complete this poll and polling. Download. All right. Now I'm going to stop sharing and good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to take a second and just make sure I get everyone on mute here before we start with Kaylee um, while I have this screen here. All right. Excellent. Okay. All right, so like I said before, our first speaker in the workshop today um, is Kaylee, and she also works for the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, she's a program organizer, and she is going to be teaching about meat processing environments in the different Western states. It's all yours, Kaylee. Thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, so as Vicki said, my name is Kaylee Chapin, and I am the program coordinator under the Beginning Farmers and Ranchers Grant at the University of Nevada, Reno. 
Um, today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the meat and poultry processing environments in the various Western states. So if you guys are very experienced in this area, I apologize. This is going to be just um, a review for you guys, and perhaps some of this information may be helpful to others. So, so to start with, before I talk about what kind of programs there are in a few of the different states, I would like to give a brief review about the meat regulations history. Uh, sometimes regulations and protocols for a safe meat supply can be complex, and many of the state and federal regulations and inspections impact the marketing and movement of meat products from the farm to the consumer. So most federal regulations apply across state lines and some regulations, however, are enacted at the state level and local levels and therefore very vary from one jurisdiction to the next. So under this Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906, um, the Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS, which is the brand, which is a branch of the US Department of Ag, conducts inspection in all establishments where cattle, goats, sheep, swine, and swine are process, processed for sale as articles of commerce, unless an exemption except inspection applies. So FSIS is responsible for ensuring the nation's com commercial supply of meat, poultry, and egg products is safe, wholesome, and correctly labeled and packaged in sanitary, in sanitary conditions. These regulations are set to prevent the manufacturing, sell, or transportation of adult, adulterated or misbranded meat and meat products. Meat and poultry and egg production is the most highly regulated food industry out there. So it's very important to make sure it is regulated um, efficiently. So there are three different, there are four different types of meat programs, which include custom exempt, federal inspected. I will probably say this wrong, this the Talmadge, Talmadge Aiken and the state inspected. So the custom exempt is the most common practice used by smaller meat slaughter and processing facilities. An operation may provide a service of slaughtering and or processing for the owner of that animal or product without the benefit of inspection. So this is allowed, this is allowed providing it is for the exclusive use of the owner, their household guests, and their employees. So you have a ranch, you can provide meat to your employees, the cowboys, the ranchers, and whatnot, um, as long as it's not being for sale. So all custom products must be identified as not for sale with that little stamp on it since they were not prepared under the USDA inspection and it may not be sold or donated. So this type of operation is, is exempt from inspection of, with limitations. They must meet the same requirements for sanitation that USDA inspected plants must meet, like rec keeping records, showing the number of kinds of livestock, quantity, and types of products prepared. Also the names, addresses, of the owners of the custom prepared meat products as well. So FSIS will verify compliance with these with FMIA requirements annually. Um, and facilities can offer both official and custom exempt products. However, they need products need to be kept separate and apart from USDA or state inspected products and must be handled in a sanitary manner. Be legibly stamped and have some means of identifying ownership of the meats. So these products that are under the exempt can be transported in commerce from the location where the animal was slaughtered or processed to the owner of the animal from which the meat was derived. Other types of exemptions are retail stores, restaurants, restaurant central kitchen facilities, and caterers. So moving on, to the federal inspected. Um, this inspection is conducted by the FSIS and must have an inspector on site for the entire process. Inspection includes an anti-mortem inspection of the live animal, verification of humane handling requirements, post-mortem 
inspection to ensure the meat of the carcass and internal organs are fit for consumption, inspection of the facilities and equipment to ensure sanitary conditions, review sanitation standard operation, operating procedures, and hazard analysis critical control point plans and label approval. So meat products from a federally approved source that are properly packaged and labeled can be sold um, to retail or wholesale between state, territory, or, district, or the District of Columbia. They may also be exported to other countries. So this one that I cannot pronounce the greatest, uh, the Talmadge Aiken, it is, um, this plant refers to those facilities that operate under the, this act of 1962. And the act allows the coordination of state and federal food safety guidelines. The act allows trained inspectors who are state employees to staff meat, plant, meat packing plants with USDA inspection privileges. So a TA plant, um, operates as a federally inspected plant and past meat products carry the federal mark of inspection and can be sold across state lines. So there are approximately 360 meat and poultry establishments in nine states are, are covered under these agreements. We have Alabama, Georgia, Illinois, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Texas, Utah, and Virginia. And moving on to the state inspection programs, um, they must be authorized by USDA and undergo at least annual comprehensive reviews of slaughtering, preparation, processing, storage, handling, and distribution. So meat from state inspected plants can be sold, um, but it's only within the state provided the inspection and interstate sales of the meat from state inspected plants is prohibited. So it's granted by the USDA and FSIS, gives authority to the appropriate state agency to develop and administer a state meat inspection program for interest interstate commerce. And the state program must implement inspections, requirements, regulations, and procedures that are equal to, to those enforced by the USDA and FSIS. Employees are required to participate in regular training to meet cooperative agreements at least equal to livestock inspection, slaughter inspection, ha hazard analysis, sanitation standard operation procedures, and performance standards. Um, FSIS does provide funding and assistance. So the state MPI program, the meat processing inspection program can be reimbursed up to 50% of their cost by the federal government. Um, according to a staff member in Arizona, Rick Mann, he is a part of the poultry and meat pro um, program there. And he mentioned that there's challenges for some states maintaining state programs, such as covering the initial cost of training and retaining personnel. So some states have lost their state inspections. State inspection programs operate under a cooperative agreement with the FSIS and facilities in states with both state, with state inspection can choose between FSIS or state inspection. So the difference between the two, two just to summarize that, um, is that state inspection programs only allow for meat processing facilities to be sold within state, while FSIS can be um, exported to other states. So if you look here at the map, um, there's 27 states in the US that have state meat inspection programs. Um, and these programs are the equal to, equal to programs. 25 of these states have both meat and poultry inspections, um, but two of the states that do not are Georgia and South Dakota. Uh, they only have meat inspection and poultry and Poultry inspection in South Dakota is under the authority of the FSIS. And Vicki, you might know more on that. So I, I did this little, um, I did this little chart here to show, um, we just picked a few of the states that have the state programs. And Arizona, you can see, has, a, has 29 official plants of which are only 
seven are only slaughter facilities and they have 54 custom, custom plants. In Montana, they have 16 that are both slaughter and processing and 19 that are only processing facilities. According to the USDA FSIS site, there are 26 federal facilities and there are 128 custom exempt facilities, um, three of which are poultry, 35 are processing, and 90 have encompassed both. North Dakota, there are eight state slaughter facilities and five um, state processing facilities. And there are nine slaughter and 10 processing under the federal and 74 custom exempt. In South Dakota, there are 33 that have both slaughter and processing. And then according to USDA, there are 29 federal and there are 56 custom exempts in South Dakota. Um, in South Dakota, the meat inspection program provides inspection service just to small and very small slaughter and processing establishments throughout the state. In Utah, um, 15, there are 15 both slaughter and processing that are state inspected and two that are only state slaughter. And there are 17 federal facilities and 38 custom exempt. And in Wyoming, um, according to one of the staff members of the Department of Ag, there are five that have both slaughter and processing that are inspected by the state and five that are state um, that only process that are inspected by the state. And there are nine federal facilities and 30 exempt. I'm just going to dive a little deeper. Um, Utah and Wyoming, they have really, um, really good resources online and, and really strong meat, meat and poultry programs. So you can see here in the map, um, this is where you can see all of the different, different meat establishments. And actually, there are quite a few around Salt Lake. Um, and then also, this just has a brief overview of what type of stamps are used and the type of inspection programs that are monitored throughout the state. In Wyoming, as I mentioned earlier, there is a total of 60 meat plants and the categories are state inspected, custom exempt, and wild game. And this picture, I just wanted to provide it because this is how they market their beef program online. And they have this really neat fact sheet here with selling beef in Wyoming. Um, as you can see here, the category for wild game is no license needed unless meat is going to be donated. And WDA will provide inspection and license upon owner request. And when I spoke to the Department of Ag member, he mentioned that of those 30 exempt processing facilities, they may or may not process wild game. It just kind of depends more on the season. So here's just a few of the states that do not have state inspection programs. Um, if you can see here, there are currently nine states working towards getting their state inspection programs. Um, California, you see they have a federal, and I say yes, they have a state inspection, but it's actually a designated inspection where it is controlled only by the state and they do not work under the USDA for it. Um, and their custom exempt program in California only covers mobile solder operators. And they have a total of 681 facilities, um, according to the USDA. Um, the state of Idaho does not have a state inspection program. So as a result, all the inspected facilities within the state are governed by USDA regulations and guidance as to the facility and practice requirements. So just a random side note um, with Idaho, the 10th largest beef processing operation in the US is headquartered in Boise, Idaho, so it's kind of neat. Um, and in New Mexico, they state inspection was replaced with federal inspection in 2007. So going back to those challenges I had mentioned earlier, such as funding, um, that is why New Mexico no longer has it, but they are working to get their state inspection back. Nevada, um, there is federal inspection, there's no state inspection. Um, there are two establishments 
for slaughter and processing, which are wolf pack meats and fallow and livestock. There's one establishment with slaughter, um, it's called York Meats. And there are 35 establishments for processing across the state, which I'm still looking into. So I'm gonna dive a little bit into California because their program is very unique from other states. Um, I had a conversation with David Schur, he's the senior environmental specialist in California um, for the Department of Ag, and they do have a state inspection program. It's not equal to program, but he said that the designated state, it follows most of the same guidelines as USDA FSIS, um, but again, due to funding, they were no longer able to do the state inspection program. So um, meat inspection, so meat processing establishments that prepare meat and poultry products by curing, smoking for preservation, drying, or rendering for retail sales only, except products of fallow deer, which can be transported and sold in commerce. So they oversee this. This is one of their state programs. Um, they have a custom livestock slaughterhouses that slaughter cattle, sheep, swine, goats, and deer raised or brought live by owners. The meat from cattle, sheep, swine, and goats is used by the animal's owner. Members of the owner's household, non-paying guests and employees cannot be sold. Um, but this is kind of the area where they do have to, they do have to be regulated by the state of California. Um, they have poultry plants. These slaughter species don't require anonymous um, federal inspection. And there's retail poultry plants that sell live poultry and slaughter them for customers, or there's non-retail poultry plants that slaughter or process fewer than 20,000 poultry of all amenable species. Um, they also regulate pet food in California. Um, they license the following pet food slaughterers that slaughter livestock or poultry for use in pet food, um, processors that prepare fresh or frozen pet food from meat and poultry products, and pet food importers that import not for human consumption meat poultry products into California. Um, so David had also mentioned that um, creating a custom livestock slaughter facility in California can be very challenging. There are currently over 500 licensed and trained state inspectors and they have to be present constantly during the process. So here's just an overview of their mobile slaughter operator. As you can see, I just provided this flow, flow chart here, which kind of shows the process. So um, in California, this is kind of under their exempt program. A mobile slaughter operator who provides services to an owner of livestock if the slaughter occurs on the premises of a person who raised the livestock subject or subject to the following conditions. So here's the steps. Producer sells cattle to new owner, change of ownership. Producer has a brand inspection to verify change of ownership. Producer schedules slaughter. Um, MSU harvests the animal and transfers the carcass to a California Department Federal um, uh, registered custom exempt processor. And then the MSU provide, provides the processor with matching owner livestock information. And then the, the product gets processed as directed by the owner and identified the carcass and finished product as not for sale. So I found this interesting that in California with the mobile slaughter unit, um, it's one exempt, but they have to go to say the ranch who's providing the beef, they have to actually go to that facility and um, do the slaughtering there. Also in California, there are two slaughter operators that are actually inspected by the USDA. And these, these two operations that are currently going on, they, are, um, they, they have an inspector from the USDA with them at all times. And then they provide the product to restaurants currently. And just here is just a brief overview if you're different scenarios. And this is provided on the California web, web page. Um, this has a lot of the different scenarios, say your meat for personal consumption or live animal cells and the scenario of meat cells. So um, I would gladly provide you this information and 
if there's any questions, I would be glad to try to answer them to the best of my ability. Excellent. Do we have any questions for Kaylee? Um, we can ask some right now, or we're going to do questions again at the very end. That was amazing information. I had no idea those statistics and how each state is so different. Really why we wanted her to do that research. So that was really thorough. Thank you so much. Okay, I am not seeing any questions right now. Um, as always, we can get these slide decks to anyone that wants them, as well as they'll be up on the um, extension uh, website. So, okay, so let's go on and we're gonna go to Slaughter and Processing Business Development with Stacy. Stacy, there we go, perfect. You're on mute. Mute. Okay, I needed to stop the share to get off mute. So I'm going to I understand. Okay, can you see? Yep, it looks great. Okay. All righty. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the business development side of it and where we're at um, at the University of Nevada Reno in our extension program. So today I want to kind of go over a vision, a business and marketing development, a little bit of concepts. I'm going to go through how we're working through um, creating a mobile slaughter unit from the ground up. And then I have one slide to discuss workforce development. And please stop me if you have any questions today. Um, one of the things is these start with your vision. So in deciding what motivates you, the inspiration, the why, I think when COVID-19 hit, we all kind of got forced back into um, kind of looking at our local environments and food within our local environments. And we are getting a lot of requests in business development right now for slaughter and processing and kind of taking them through what is their vision? Why do they want to do it? Um, there is some control in that, in that if you're your own business, um, you have that decision-making power and you have more control over your own destiny, whether that's, you know, making more money or making money a different way, lifestyle, quality of life, and then challenges. I have some risk management slides because this is not an easy business development thing. It has not even been easy for us at a university level to get from where we started to where we're at now to where we need to go. So just assessing your business risk when you get in here and protecting yourself from your business, we're asking the individuals that work with us to really look at this and think about and brainstorm the different scenarios that could happen to them as they work through this process. You know, we get a lot of individuals and one of the things when we get an individual in our state that says, okay, I want to go up to Elko County in Northern Nevada. Um, I grew up slaughter and processing. I want to open a plant. I'm willing to go the 1.5 million infrastructure costs. I'm going to buy my land. I'm going to do this. The first thing I do is we have an economist in extension, Carol Bishop, and I said, if I can get you to take a step back and be thinking about your business planning and how you're going to manage this, how it's going to start, how you're going to move forward, I'd like you to go set with a colleague of mine to go through your cash flows and kind of develop your financial plan. And when Carol gets with them and starts asking questions, it starts to change how they're assessing that risk because she's going to ask those important questions about how they're going to make money, how that's all going to work. Um, and that brings us back to knowing where you are financially, knowing your costs of production, understanding your markets, who are you selling to, what services are you selling to if you're slaughtering and processing. Um, know that you have risk management tools available, but let's Let's educate you on what those are and um, make sure that you're communicating with your family, your employees, if you have them, loan officers, insurance agents. And most of all, you want to set those goals, developing that plan 
in transitioning farms. Um, I always have this transitioning farms to ge one generation to another because of state planning also, depending on the age that you are in starting this business. So again, what is your tolerance to risk, your risk attitude, your risk bearing ability, and your risk tolerance? This is not an easy business. Um, we have kind of transitioned in the United States to large packing plants. And when COVID hit, we're coming back the other way, um, which is risky. And so to know that risk tolerance of yourself personally, if you're starting one of these businesses is extremely important. And most of all, setting your guideposts. Um, success depends on resources. So again, what are your personal business resource inventories, your physical resource inventory and your fiscal resource inventory? And I'm gonna get in a little bit to this when we get into marketing um, later on. Um, so some of the preempt questions is, are you going to do slaughter and processing? Are you going to do both of them? Do you have a location? Do you have that in mind? Do you have livestock available near you? Um, you would think that that should be a logical question, but it isn't always when we start asking and doing demographics of, you know, what kind of livestock are you going to be slaughtering? What kind of numbers do you have in your area? Um, and start asking those questions, but be thinking about that. What jurisdictions and or regulations do you have? Nevada has Clark County, we've got Las Vegas. Um, we do have some interest down in Las Vegas, but we also have a very strict health department. You would be very surprised um, the difference between Clark County's health department and our state health department, which we're working with right now. So Las Vegas has a lot more restriction than we do in the rural part of the state, which you know I'm sure other states are seeing that in your large urban areas, you do have a lot more regulation. And then again, going back to resources, what are your resources that you do have available? Um, now, slaughter and processing market overview, again, going back to how much, first of all, livestock is available. And I think the other thing that I'll get into, I have a, just a couple of slides to brief over it, is you know, you're selling a service. So if you're, if you're in that plant and you're slaughtering or you're processing, what are those services gonna look like? So again, we recommend, we are recommending everybody that wants to start out, starting out small um, and to kind of test those markets and to build those markets. And you know, if they're successful at a smaller, a smaller level, then, then they can start working on a growth plan. But right now, um, what are those businesses gonna look like and how are they gonna fit in the marketplace? And you know that includes your niche markets also. So one of your things that we look at, and Charlie's sitting here in the room with me, he's sitting right behind me, but one of the things we constantly talk about as we're going through these is kind of your marketing. <clears throat> whether you're selling the meat product yourself or whether you're providing that service of slaughter and processing, you know, there's three things that we really want you to look at is your customer, your cost, and your marketplace, your competition. Um, so kind of leading back to what is going to be your story. We constantly run into producers that want processing a certain way because they may be selling a high-end product. So instead of giving a little check in the box that all of my steaks are going to be one inch thick. Maybe this customer wants two inch thick steaks because she's selling white goo and her customers expect that they're paying a higher cost. So not all of our plants here right now do that. Um, that's why we're seeing a lot of going custom and we do have some regulation that Kaylee was talking about previously that is causing some aches and pains for us. But that is one of the things in this to look at is, you know, what are you going to be providing in either a product or a service? So, and determining going back, and this is an enterprise budget for basically a ranch. Um, Carol and I were going back and forth over our mobile processing budget yesterday. So I do not want to put it up here because um, we could not agree on some things, but we will have that budget probably in another couple of weeks because we're trying to set our costs as far as our, our fee service costs for our mobile slaughter unit. 
So we are looking at all of these costs. And again, going back to looking at what are you providing? What are your prices gonna be? And once you start working through these budgets, and this is just an example, like I said, this is a cow-calf type budget, but we will have some for slaughter and processing. What is that gonna look like? I mean, as you're going through all of those questions and hiring, um, how are you gonna do that? What is, if you're providing a service, what is that service gonna be? Are you gonna have guarantees of friendliness and reliability and trustworthiness? There's a lot of people that, you know, take their steer into a custom plant and swear they don't get their own meat back. You know, are you gonna guarantee that there's a process of traceability so that you know that customer is absolutely getting their own product back? And, you know, we actually have lawsuits about that. There is a rumor about a lawsuit in the state now about that. So, and then again, determining your product. So those are the types of things that you want to look at. Um, if you're selling, you know, depending on, and Roy's going to go a lot into it on the producer side of selling that meat product, but what makes your product different? We have one individual that's working with us right now that mixes Wagyu with Red Angus. Um, she sells all of her animals live. She goes through custom. Again, she wants those cut up very particular. Um, she wants certain cuts. She wants the meat a certain way, but that price tag on the product she's selling is high. So she has to guarantee those qual that quality to her customers. And then the benefits, what will that make a difference to your consumer? She sold out everything she can raise. She sold out at a pretty high cost. Um, so, but that's one of the things that she guarantees. And then your consumer demand period uh, pyramid. This is kind of old, but I love this slide here about looking at, and we use this as far as buying beef, buying those local beef. And what does that look like? And how does it relate to income and the food preferences? Now I'm going to take you into, and Charlie has a few more pictures, so I'm not going to give you a lot of pictures, but when COVID hit and this all came to the forefront, Carol Bishop and I had worked on this 10 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, and we had set up a bunch of workshops through our beginning farmer and rancher program about 10 years ago on how to do a local beef product. But when COVID hit, we had this bottleneck, we had all these animals, we couldn't get them through the slaughtering and processing. So we decided when we were, we got together and we were like, okay, we can do this again like we did 10 years ago. We set up the workshops, but we really didn't dive in that deep end. We really didn't get in the mud with either the producer or the entrepreneur trying to do this. So as an extension person and an extension educator, we can always set outside and read all the regulations and advise. But this time our team decided and we had to make a decision on, okay, we're not really getting the impact. People are saying they wanna do this, but they're saying they just can't get it done. So our team decided, well, let's jump in and see if we can do it on the ground and set some kind of precedent or at least figure out how to get it done. So we did that and we put together a team. Um, I am the project lead. We have um, Dr. Lindsay Chichester. She's an extension educator up in Douglas County in the Gardnerville area. She's our livestock quality assurance. We have Carol on our economics. Hamilton DeMello is our meat scientist. So he helps us with HACCP and SOPs. Charlie's sitting right here with me with the slaughtering and processing skill building expertise. We have Catherine Lacey, who is a consumer preference economist. And then we're adding additional team members because we're finding that for the individuals, the average HACCP plan can cost you 15 to $20,000. And we kind of thought that was a little bit ridiculous um, so you have these things on US, the USDA website that you can do, but we have extension educators within our counties, a couple of them that really want to learn the HACCP process and be able to teach that. 
So that's what we're looking at for our future is to be able to have that expertise within some of our county educators so that they can help those entrepreneurs when they do come forward. Now, Catherine Lacey and the rest of our team, we did some consumer preference on meat and where they purchased meat, whether, and we did it in conjunction with Utah, with Ruby Ward in Utah. And I just have a couple of slides on that. You know, you can see, have you ever purchased meat or produce directly from a local producer? Um, how important are the following reasons you have not purchased meat products directly from producers? Um, through this, and I only have a couple of slides because this is a whole presentation in itself. We found out in Nevada that we have huge differences between Las Vegas and Reno. Reno is a foodie town. People love grow local. They love the farmer's markets. They hang out in the farmer's markets. They go to restaurants that has local food. Las Vegas is not like that. It's not that they don't have the farmer's markets. We don't know if it's been access to local foods, if that's their issue, or um, if it's just a different environment. We have some that believe Reno's getting more transplants out of the San Francisco area where Las Vegas gets more transplants out of LA, Los Angeles. But we're gonna keep evaluating that and see if it's an access issue because one of our, large, our largest pork producer is in Clark County, right outside of Las Vegas. And he is selling pork directly now. He just opened up a good, a really nice website um, directly from the farm to the consumer. But he's had a hard go of it because that demographic is just not there yet. So in addition, we did a producer tour in November of 2020. So Charlie and I and Lindsay and Carol we set out to see in Southern, Western and Northern Nevada, um, what were the needs out there? What, what did the producer need? Was there a need for USDA slaughter? Was there a need for custom slaughter and processing? Do we need to intertwine both? Um, coming out of this tour, we had the sense that we had up here on the North or the Western side of the state, they did want USDA inspection. Our largest pork producer wanted USDA inspection, but a lot of our smaller guys selling high-end beef wanted that custom slaughter and processing. So um, in Elko County, where the majority of our livestock, our beef numbers are, we're looking at custom. We did have some individuals that said they would love USDA slaughter, but for the majority of the producers, they were looking at that custom and selling that live animal. So. We were funded through a CARES Act project last year. It did have an end date of December 30th, 2020. I can tell you um, there's no way we would have met that. Our trailer, we just picked up our trailer um, four weeks ago. Was it four weeks? Three or four weeks ago. So we do have our trailer now. Um, we're working on the ranch site, the permitting, the sanitation, um, and it's Mazzini Ranches is our first site. Um, our long-term goal and extension is the training, is the workforce development. So, and we haven't even been able to um, get there yet because we want to get this first site at Mazzini Ranches in Yarrington, Nevada, USDA inspected. So here is our trailer um, infrastructure. One of our first things that we had, because we built this from the ground up, we couldn't go to Friesla and afford the three to 400,000 tri-van type um, trailer and we didn't want to be pulling it with a semi. So this is the first, um, after this picture was taken, we had to call them because it was not tall enough. I believe this height right here is 10 feet. So we had to have them cut the top off and add another foot because we needed 11 and a half feet inside the trailer. Here is our design. Um, this is a shot of the back end of the trailer. Charlie will go more into what's inside the trailer and he has the designs. Also, we have a 10 foot trailer space or cooler space in the front. Um, we do have what they had originally designed as gut storage. We don't know if we'll be able to use that. Um, we're kind of double or thinking about that right now on how we're gonna do that. There is an eight foot winch out the back that you can see. Um, 
It's easy to pull. It is not easy to turn. It is on four axles. So we're pulling it right now with the Dodge Dually. We did come in overweight. The trailer came in at 18,000 pounds itself. We figured by the time it's full, we'll probably be around 30 to 32,000 pounds. Um, right now with driver's license, I got a farm endorsement. Um, we have somebody from NHP Nevada Highway Patrol that says the farm endorsements will work. But I do think there's a few of the team that are going to get their non-commercial class A driver's license just to be safe. But there it is. So the ranch site, this is where I was yesterday with the rancher. And what we have to do for the site, we have to have a water test um, and they want the normal test, but they're they're looking for the coliforms and the nitrates at a minimum. We need a permit from the county on land type. This really isn't gonna be an issue in this county, but we need something documenting from the planning department that it is an agricultural area and we are doing an agricultural activity. Sanitation letter from the state. Yesterday I learned that, that the county is rural, so they want us to work with the health department, which is the state health department for our sanitation letter. Most mobile units do not have septics. They can, but they don't. So we'll see what that process looks like. Inspector office space. This was gonna be one of the toughest things for us because we were originally told we needed an office with a bathroom, with a shower, and um, had to have heat and air. In talking to um, USDA FSIS, she's in Las Vegas, and we're in the California region too, Nevada and California. We were very lucky that two USDA inspected mobile units got started in California. And they, as far as office space, one of those mobile units has a picnic table under a tree with a sandy hut and hand sanitizer. So we got lucky as far as office space. What they are worried about is in Nevada, we do get cold. So we're gonna have to have some type of shelter with a heater for that inspector when it gets cold. Um, livestock pens, we must include a suspect pen um, and pens for the separation of the different species. At this site, we're looking at beef, lambs, beef and lambs. Um, and then a suspect pen that USDA is saying needs a temporary cover. I asked if that temporary cover could be a shade cloth yesterday. Um, our UNR meat scientists thought that would work. Now, the other thing is the kill box. So what is that gonna look like? We're right now, the producer is modifying a chute um, that will open up with a winch. We don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. Hopefully we find out by next week. Our trailer unit needs 220 power. We don't absolutely have to have it because we have a generator but it would be nice to hook up to 220 power. Now the pad, originally they had had the asphalt pad, but because we have to move because it's close to an onion shed and their food safety plan, plan, they're either going to look at pouring a cement pad or looking at the gravel pad. And I asked the producer to um, kind of come up with what he would like to do and we'll try to get that in and see. Um, we are going to have all the blood and all the awful. We're working with a company that right now does, it's a Sandy Hut company, and we're asking them to get into this business to haul off the blood and awful for us um, in this area. So fees, that's what we're looking at right now. Carol and I are running the budgets. Um, and I don't really want to say anything about the cost other than, um, we do have to have pay an inspector and that fee per hour went up to $66 and 56 cents an hour. Um, in addition, we're going to have to have some costs on the UNR extension side so that we can, we're just looking at reimbursement. We're not looking at making any money and we're looking at depreciation on the trailer um, and the truck. Now the rancher is also going to have a fee side because he's got the liability of people coming on and he's building that infrastructure. So he's gonna have a cost there too. So my last slide basically is on workforce development. One of the things that we're telling people when they come to us to say, I wanna go into this business, I ask them right away, do you have employees or do you know how to do this yourself? 
because workforce is a problem right now. And there is gonna be a problem finding workforce if you think you can go out and hire. Um, most of the plants that we've been helping have been dealing with this. And that's eventually where we wanna go once we get this trailer, slaughter trailer up and going. But I can guarantee you, even with Charlie here, I'm hoping before Charlie leaves us, he'll be able to train somebody to run this mobile slaughter unit and help us in our programs. Um, Cause I'm sure sometime Charlie's gonna wanna retire for good. Um, but right now, this is our goal is, you know, to get this slaughter, mobile slaughter unit up and running and switch to the workforce development and training people how to do this. So with that, that is my last slide. Do we have any questions? We do, let me, <laughs> let me start. Um, okay, so David Tam was wondering, um, what was the total cost to build this and do you have to get USDA approved and what documents do you need for tribal lands? Okay, so our trailer came in um, at 90,000 and then we had them raise it a foot, which delayed it and we added some more stuff to it. So our final bill for the build out of the trailer was about $100,000. Okay. Now, going to your ranch site on tribal land, I would think, you know, I would think you would want to stay close to the same process. It's just your jurisdictions are different. And I think one of the things you need to, if you're looking at USDA inspection on tribal land, it's still federal to federal. You're going to have to meet that USDA inspection criteria. If you're looking at custom, you know, there's probably going to be nobody there to regulate you on tribal land because the state can't get onto the reservation. However, you don't want anybody getting sick either. So if you can try to work through um, those processes and depending on what the reservations jurisdictions are, whether you have allotted land, whether you're operating on tribal land, whether you're operating on a lease from either an allottee or a tribe, I mean, those are gonna bring in different jurisdictions. On an allotment, you still got the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is federal. So I would think you would still want to work through um, kind of some of these processors. I don't see this ranch site as a really tough process. You know, if they wanna do it cheaper with a pad, putting some gravel down, um, you know, we do have a pressure washer that goes with our trailer that can go up to 180 degrees for sanitation. We can put chemical through it. We did buy that with the mobile unit, but I don't see it as being a big problem. The sanitation letter, you know, stuff like that, that's where you're going to have to work through kind of those kinks of being on a reservation and see if you have a process there. And maybe go to a health department, which I haven't went to the state health department and see what they're going to require. That may surprise me and they come down with all these criteria. but I'm hoping that we're gonna to have to get the state and USDA FSIS together and say, okay, let's find a workable solution. And I think if you were on a reservation, you would have to get somebody from the tribe there um, whoever staff that they thought could handle it and work through some of those processes. You still want to humanely put down the animal. Um, you don't need maybe a kill box. Maybe, you know, if you can shoot them and get them down, but you just want that to be a humane process. You don't want to be turned in for any of this. Okay, next question is from Felix Nez. What is the break even price for smaller slaughter facilities or even for a mobile slaughter? Oh, that's a tough one, Felix. We haven't totally gotten there yet. If you were to ask me yesterday when Carol and I were going through our budget, if we were to just do a mobile slaughter unit for the Yerington site, um, I'm going to stop my share. If we were okay. going to do just a the mobile slaughter unit with the cost that we have incurred right now at the Yerington site, killing five steers a week, our break even is 400 bucks. However, we had to come back and recircle that in the economics to say this trailer is going to be used more than just the Yarrington site. 
So putting all costs onto the Yearington site is unfair. So we have to come back and analyze. It's going to be in Yearington one day a week. That's 20%. So if you look at 20% of the $400, but that $400 was not paying the USDA inspector $66.56 an hour. So, you know, there's, like I said, with our budgets, they get pretty complicated. And right now we don't have that break even cost. You know, if we went to Woodpeck Meats that's been running a plant for a long time, they probably do have that break even cost. And I don't know, Charlie, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, custom is pretty sim is simpler than what we're trying to do. The, the biggest part on your on your break even is who's doing the work? Are you hiring as a crew or are you doing it yourself? So if you're if you're out there working, you're gonna save yourself a lot of costs doing the doing it yourself. But everything, there's so many factors that go into that is the cost of your property, your building, your, your mobile unit, your, your staffing, how many animals you're going to do, how big are you going to be? That's, that's a, a tough question. Okay, yes. Um, all right, the next two questions are for Kaylee. Um, they were wondering if there is mobile service in Kansas and if there's one in Arizona. So according to the Kansas Department of Ag, there is um, just one in Kansas and it's a mobile operator and it's actually regulated by the USDA. And when I spoke with the Department of Ag in Arizona um, regarding the operators, they said that there may be some, not very many under exempt, but there are no state or federal inspected in Arizona due to the complications of everything being so rural, um, it would be hard to maintain the regulations and requirements um, in the rural areas and having an inspector go with them to locations as well. It's just, it's just not very um, feasible in Arizona. Okay, great. And then I'm just gonna read this aloud. There's a question, what, what, um, what is HACCP? And it's a hazard analysis. This is from Justin Latham, thank you. Hazard, hazard analysis critical control points. It is a food safety system built by Pillsbury and NASA to keep astronauts safe from foodborne illnesses that has been adopted by USDA and FDA. Okay. I can Pretty tell good. you just to add to your HACCP plans, it's a bunch of language that is gonna be hard to understand. And if they would just put it in simple terms, like this is how we're cutting the head off the steer, <laughs> we have a lot easier time than having to Google all these terms that they put in them. But I think it's a learning process and that's what we're doing is we're learning. I have one question for Stacy. Sure, right. How come, uh, how come you have to pay for your inspector? That's what we've been told. We checked with our Wolfpack mates at the university and they're charging our, they're charging them per monthly too. USDA never used to charge. Only for buffalo, if you killed buffalo or something yeah. unamenable. But otherwise, it was a free service. And if we get that free, we will let everybody know. But right now, everything we're hearing is the, is the new fee. And it changed in January, January 3rd, 2021. You better give them a good talking to, Stacey. <laughs> uh, OK, Jack? Yeah, that, that was my impression also. The USDA, when you got the bud, when you when you passed the test, then the inspection was free except for overtime. So Justin, yeah. you might have a comment on that. He's our uh, state, uh, Wyoming state uh, guru with the Wyoming Department of Agriculture. That's, that's how it was always, has always been unless something's changed just recently. Anytime I was in the plant, we never paid for inspectors except for overtime. And I can tell you there's a special overtime fee too. It's not $66.54. I believe yeah, it's about $84. Twice. <laughs> it should be, should be time and a half. <laughs> I know overtime I'd like to earn, let me tell you. Yeah. Okay, so our next question I'm going to answer as I introduce Roy Lemon. He is a tribal producer on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. Sean Realbird had a question of whether this has been done on tribal lands or with the tribe. And the answer is yes. Cheyenne River Sioux used to have a buffalo um, processing unit 
it started out as mobile and then Roy um, found grants and made it um, permanent. It was a program that was highly successful. Uh, he traveled with the IEC in their export program. Um, we used to have lines around the whole pavilion waiting for buffalo meat to taste it. So since then, our tribe has um, ruined that. So <laughs> they're back up and running and doing beef again. But um, anyway, so Roy is our next speaker. And if you give me one second, I am going to bring up his first yeah, in defense uh -huh. of that, politics is a bad thing, let me tell you. Yes. Okay, so the first one's break even, correct? Yes. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I, uh, I'm going to try and uh, just kind of add on to what Stacy was doing. Uh, so what you kind of need to do is decide what kind of beef product you want. So you're going to have to uh, uh, decide what kind of uh, breed you want to go down because uh, some breeds are they don't have any very little marbling fat so they're leaner and some some breeds have lots of marbling fat and so it's just a different product and uh, mostly we have our own uh, my wife and I have our own box program and uh, so what we've been doing is uh, just picking out critters right out of our own herd and taking them and feeding them and processing them at the local uh, process uh, processors. So anyway, one of the things that uh, we look at a lot is uh, break evens are just very important things. So this is a break even spreadsheet that I put together and uh, <laughs> I can't see it. There we go. Yeah. So. Uh, these break even. This this is just one I put together. Uh, we we also have a cow calf operation, and then we also run a lot of yearling cattle. So uh, what we do the winter and summer and some of those uh, things that you see on the spreadsheet, they'll you could if this is available to you, anybody's willing to this calculates everything for you, and uh, you can use it for just about anything you want to do. So anyway. As you see on the, uh, oh, down on the bottom right, myself off somehow there. Okay, clear down there, there should be this cost of feed gain. Uh, dang, that's not the right one for some reason. Are you doing feed to finish, feedlot cost gain? Yeah, yes. It's clear okay. down in the lower right hand corner. Okay, now I don't know how I'm going to get over there. Let me move this. Okay. Anyway, what, what it does, it just breaks down all the, all the feed costs. You can see corn per bushel, protein per ton, uh, hay. You break it down into pennies per pound, and then you put all that across there, and then it totals it for you, and then it brings it over to the, off to the left now, up on the left, upper left. And then you can see the, the cost of the cattle. At the top? Yeah, top left. There you go. Okay, okay. so now so now you can see that uh, you you got a thousand seventy eight dollar uh, steer. Uh, you gave a dollar forty for him weighing seven hundred and seventy pounds. And then uh, you can see the uh, Oh, some miscellaneous costs. I can't see the cost on the side of that. Is it clear over? Oh, can you bring the bar clear over just to the left at the bottom? Yeah. Okay, oh, how's so that? So now you got, so. Oh, there you go. Costs, yeah, the cost from the lower right hand will come up here to this winter cost. And for some reason, this one doesn't have it on there. I don't know why. I, I messed up there somehow. But anyway, I always figure in a 2% death loss on just about everything. And then uh, you got interest. And then the feedlot's going to cost about $230 for about 100, and, 100 to 120 days to feed them. Uh, right now, you can sell that steer for a buck 14. You can see that the, the break even up there is a dollar nine. So. Uh, well done. Where's the. Break you oh right here here's yeah, our break yeah, yeah. okay yeah, yeah so and clear on the left you can see that it's a dollar forty and uh, for a feeder steer and it's a dollar fourteen right now for a and I think it's higher I think it's a dollar twenty right now when from when I did this one so that's just a kind of a, a way of 
just breaking down the cost so that you can kind of see the break even and uh, what it, what it kind of takes. Uh, I usually just put in a, a creep feeder because one of the most important things about the feed part of it is that is the flavor of the meat and what they eat is the flavor. And uh, so uh, some folks don't like uh, corn. Some people want grass. Some grass, one of the problems that you have with a grass bed is if you have a lot of shrubs in your pasture and they eat those shrubs, it's going to taste a lot more wild than what you might be used to. And uh, so it's really important to kind of decide what kind of who your, who your target audience is going to be and uh, who you're going to uh, sell your product to, uh, what kind of, what, what, what do you think they're going to like? And then you can refine it. What we do is we take, we have a creep feeder in our pen. We don't feed any hay. hay. We only feed some uh, fiber, uh, just a creep feed pellet because it has enough fiber in it. And we add about 25% to the cracked corn. And then that's what they eat for about 90 days. And then uh, we trim, we trim most of the fat off. So on the next slide, we'll show you what uh, kind of what what you what you look for when you're getting ready to. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, Once. Butchers yes. here. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Thanks for the hint, Felix. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm here you go. Okay, I'm gonna decrease again so everyone can, whoo, not that far. Oh my goodness. All right, people. There. I'm getting it. There we go. Okay. Okay, so you can see when you're standing there looking, I look at, when I'm looking at something before I'm getting ready to butcher, I look at the brisket. I look at how thick the brisket is. If it's about a fist wide or wider, then it's time to go. If they're wider than that, then it's time to go. But, uh, uh, we've been trying to perfect a brisket product, so so I try to keep make sure that I got at least a fist wide on the brisket there. But you can see up on top, uh, the a fatter one at the tail head. You're not going to be able to hardly see the tail head. It's just going to be two bubbles sitting around it. And uh, if they're too lean, you can see that the you know the tail they just need to be on feed longer. Anyway, this is just a cheat sheet of, you know, if anybody's interested in doing this program, then you can get, this is just something to look at to kind of give you an idea. Okay, on the third. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, here we go. So in our, in our basic uh, box program that we kind of, that we're doing, we, these are some of the things that we look at. So basically, and, and these numbers vary because one of the things that you got to remember, every rancher's outfit, every rancher's genetic profile is different. It's like a thumbprint. And uh, when we used to kill a lot of cattle, you could see that the, the, the cattle would, would be, one, one rancher's cattle would feed out and look exactly like another rancher's cattle but the yields would be different. And we used to do a block test on everything when we would, when we would kill something. And we would take, and on those block tests, we would find out what the yield was off the carcass. Now, we had, we had some carcasses yield over 80%. We had a lot of carcasses yield around 75%. And uh, what's kind of amazing, when we were doing a, a lean buffalo program at, oh, a few, quite a few years ago, uh, the grass-fed buffalo that we were that we were slaughtering actually yielded more uh, more than seventy percent off the carcass, but we grew. We it was all a grind too, so you know we didn't throw anything away. Now one of the things that happens to us when we take these cattle and and butcher them is we have a lot of fat cover on the outside, and the outside fat is the so-called unhealthy fat. But if you go to the grocery store and you buy a pound of burger. You bring that pound of burger home and you fry it up in your pan and you got an inch of grease in the bottom of it. That's because all the big packers, they call those 50-50s when they trim all that fat off. So they take that fat and then they blend it into the burger to make your 85-15 or your, your 80-20, what, what, you know, whatever blend of 
fat, they take that fat and they blend it in there. What they do a lot of times is they buy bulls and then they blend it in because the bull meat's really dry and they blend in that uh, fat. So when you cook that burger, you have a lot of grease. In our particular product, when you fry it up, we trim all that outside fat off, except for on the steaks and some of the roasts. And we, we have that trimmed off and we don't really have a market for it, but it makes a better product because when you cook the burger off, off our product, there's hardly any grease in the pan and the burgers don't shrink on you down to nothing. And so that's kind of why we do it. You can go on USDA's uh, price sheet every day and you can find all this information on this particular uh, slide here and it'll tell you the prices of all the cuts if you, individual cuts or primal cuts and it just gives you a place to go to kind of figure out about where you want to be price wise a lot of it uh, a lot of folks are willing to pay more for a product from ranchers and farmers than they are to go to the grocery store and buy it so you just got to kind of find your target audience so anyway you can see on this these are just some rough numbers uh, on this one carcass here. There was 110 pounds of bones. Uh, boneless meat was 490 pounds and fat trim was 150 pounds. Okay. I broke it down into percentages so you can see. So about 65% of that carcass, we were able to take it on over into the cuts. So, and you can see that that, that percentage goes up a lot if you have a market for that fat of marketable meat. The actual marketable meat on this particular carcass for us was 490 pounds. So then you come over here and you can see that of that carcass, there's about 13% of it is roast, 13% of it's steaks, 2% of it's strips, 2% of it's tenderloins. Tenderloins, that, I mean, they can make or break your carcass as far as money-wise. And then ground beef was 30%. So then you take all those costs over and then you can see what that what the carcass what the what the carcass actually dollared out was thirty three hundred and ninety seven dollars and and I, I I apologize I didn't have I kind of forgot to update these numbers as far as uh, the prices this was like about two months ago I believe so so anyway uh, processing costs a lot of places are just going to cost they're going to charge you a buck a pound uh, and I mean they'll sit there and say it's sixty five cents a pound. And then yeah, there's a kill charge, and then there's a disposal charge, and then there's all kinds of charges, and it's going to end up to being a buck a pound, I guarantee it. So it's just a buck a pound. So then you can see what the subtotal is, and then uh, the cost of the steer. For some reason, my bifocals aren't working as good as they should be. <laughs> but anyway, so you can see what the cost of the original steer was, and then uh, here's your profit or loss. And it was based on about $6.93 a pound. And that's in the box. All these, these are cuts. So it's not like a primal cost. This is a, it's a finished retail product when we get done. Okay. And then uh, you can see over here, uh, I just kind of showed you what, and this is kind of how we advertise it. You can have holes, halves, or quarters. And then we, we've broken it down to a 25 pound meat bundle because it's hard to find a large population of people who have a freezer big enough to put a half a beef or a quarter of beef in. It's actually getting, it's, it's, it's uh, easier now to have something to put a quarter of meat in because it seems like the cost on some of those things are less than they used to be. But most folks don't think about that. And it's just easier. If you want to move a lot of meat, you're going to have to do some smaller bundles to get it to go. So, okay. and Roy, uh, um, just to be clear, you you and your family created these Excel spreadsheets, but you're willing to to share them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And okay. I, I hope the calculations go with them, so you can mess around with them and see how they work. Yeah. They should for sure. Um, I'm going to stop share right now for questions, but I already got a request for this. If anyone wants these, could you please just either put your name in the chat box or send me an email and I can get you those. Um, they're very user-friendly. They have formulas in them already. So you should just be able to put them in, um, put your figures in and then it'll calculate it for you. So um, any questions for Roy? 
Roy, what, how do you, what kind of packaging do you use on there? Are you vacuum packing? Are you paper? What? We've, we've done it two different ways. We used one place that did paper and they didn't do a very good job. And we were really disappointed in the, in the packaging. So uh, the other place that we've been going to has been doing strictly uh, a vacuum pack. And it's by far the best. People can see the product and especially seeing the marbling and the ribeyes and everything. It's just, it's an easier product to move than it is the, the wrap package. Yes. And that's what those numbers are in there for, too. They're on, based on that vacuum pack, correct? Yeah. Well, and actually, what's amazing about it is it isn't any. It doesn't cost you any more to have the vacuum pack. So. Okay. Um, any other questions? If you're requesting his Excel spreadsheets in the chat, please include your email just in case I don't have it. Although I should have it with your registration. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. So we will move to our next presentation. We're gonna take questions at the end as well. I know that this is um, a lot of information, um, but we definitely will be able to um, do more questions towards the end. So our final presentation is on slaughter and processing things to think about from Charlie. He is a University of Nevada Reno uh, instructor. Um, and then um, we'll get back to your question, Felix, at the very end. And so there we go. Okay, Charlie, take it away. Okay, Charlie's on mute. Sorry okay, there. Okay. Was, so, so I'm not the tech side here. I'm, I'm like Roy, I'm very simple. So Stacy's going to walk me through the the tech side of this. Um, Roy, um, just want to say my dad was around it for about sixty years of his life, and that's how he taught me to judge a fat beef was by his brisket, and I share that with a lot of people, and not a lot of people talk about the briskets. So um, I'm going to give you a little um, history on myself. Uh, was kind of born and raised in a slaughter plant and my dad was a meat cutter butcher for 50 years. Um, I've spent about 14 years in a USDA plant and I have about 25 years of, of ranch kill or mobile kill and, and most of, uh, matter of fact, all of my mobile slaughter has been done um, under the bucket of a tractor. Um, just recently have the just built some forks and stuff to make it a little cleaner, a little simpler. Um, other than that, this is where we're at. I apologize if this is boring or, or um, can't answer your questions, but um, my skills were developed um, over a period of, of time. When I was a young man, my mom and dad's plant had about six to 10 employees at any given time. And over the years of, of all these small plants and the business going away, the number of employees kind of dwindled. So when I was learning to be a butcher, I had to do the whole process. There was no, there was no team to, to do one part or another part. I was, I was, um, doing the whole process. So I feel like I've developed skills over my lifetime that has made my process cleaner and made me a little better um, than, than the average butcher because most of your plants, people will do one job or two jobs and then the product moves on. And so that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Um, as we go through these processes, we'll, we'll talk about what we're, uh, what we're doing with our mobile, did it go? No, it's not gone. Okay, technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, so um, here's a little slide on the, the custom versus USDA. Your your custom product process is, is, I try to do everything when I'm doing on farm 
as well as I do it in a plant. And I kind of, I kind of get arrogant about it because I tell people I can do it as clean underneath the bucket of a tractor as they can do it in the plant. Um, but you don't have any hot water. Um, you, you don't have the facilities that you, you have in a plant, but you still can do a nice job. If you, if you take your time and you have that pride and that, that um, respect for that carcass, then you can still do a good job out on the farm. Um, this little slide shows uh, a couple things that, you know, you don't have sterilizers when you're on the farm. Um, we are gonna have those in, the, in our mobile unit. Um, the, the hot water, the, the carts, you know, sometimes the guts are dumped into a barrel or sometimes they're dumped on the ground. Um, but you still can keep things clean if you, if you do things right. So here's a picture of, in our, we just saw this one earlier, of the, of the mobile unit that we picked up. And we've kind of designed this um, with Robert in Idaho. I don't know if um, we got it perfect, but I feel like we, we, um, we hit a home run. There's a couple little things that we figured out after the fact that we need to fix or change, but um, I think we have a pretty good setup. We're hoping to get it through the USDA and they'll be happy with it. Um, the next slide is going to show us some uh, uh, good look at the, oh, no, we jumped from the trailer to the, to the pins. Mm -hmm. So we just came up with a little diagram on the pins of what, what may be beneficial in a in a little mobile um, setup. Are they seeing these two slides? No. Okay. That's the next one. So the, the next one is gonna be the, ins the inside of the, the mobile unit. You can see the hoist, the cradle, um, the air curtains. And then the second picture is the, the cooler. We're thinking, I'm thinking I can get about five to six um, hot carcasses in there. I think if the carcasses were cold, we could get eight pretty easy. But when the, when the animals are hot, you don't want to crowd them. You want to make sure there's plenty of space between, between the carcasses. Um, so that's a good look at the trailer. We, we think it's turned out good. If you, if you look in the corner, you can see the sinks and um, the, everything's stainless steel, the sterilizers, the sinks, the walls, um, the, the sinks, a, a, you uh, operate it with your knee, you just bump up against a hot or cold. Um, so we're, we're excited to try to get out there and, and get it dirty and see how it works, see how everything goes. But I really feel like we designed a pretty nice um, trailer and feel like they did a really nice job on the on the trailer. Can we pause for a question really quick? Sure. Because um, it's relevant. Um, Justin wants to know what is the overall rail height of your trailer? So so this one and, and Stacy um, touched on that earlier. Um, we had to bump it up a little bit, but I think we're 10 and a half feet from the rail to floor. And that was that was the regulation from USDA. Okay, thank you. So the next slide is just um, a, a beef that we butchered a couple weeks ago. Stacy came out and took some pictures of it. And so we're gonna walk through the process of, um, of the mobile slaughter and, and you'll get a look at a little look at the, at the uh, rack I built to bring the, to, so my original ventures were always done right under the bucket of the tractor. So there was a lot of time spent cleaning the bucket, make sure there was no manure or no dirt or anything on it. And then when I built this rack, it pushed everything away and I got some stainless steel hooks that will chain right up to my rack. I don't have to uh, run chains through those hind legs anymore. It's, it's a little cleaner, it's a little nicer. Um, just something over the, I had the idea for a long time, just never did, um, pursue it. And so anyway, we'll get a good look at, at everything. We did skip, um, the first process of course is shooting them. Um, 
when you're doing it on the ranch, it's usually in a small pin or, um, you know, maybe sometimes you throw a flake of hay down and uh, I use a 22 and we, we try to do it as quickly and humanely as possible. Um, then you hang the, the animal up by the hind legs and um, you bleed them. And then the first thing you do is take the head off. We didn't take pictures of that, but um, this is the next process. We lay them down on a cradle and then you start on the, on the legs. This is a little uh, slide of taking the hind leg off. And uh, so we're just gonna walk through the process of, of everything that goes on. And um, you, you get a look at what's going on. So you take the legs off and then um, you open up the center of the carcass. And then you start what you call a siding process. And so, what you're trying to do is take that hide off and, and not allow any, any contamination whatsoever to fall off that hide or fall back onto your carcass or anything, any dirt on your hands or anything, you know, so, so a lot of time spent washing my hands because if I get a little something on my hands um, and I go back to work, then it's on my carcass. Um, so, so these are just some, some quick little pictures of, of, what's going on in the process and, and how I'm trying to keep it clean. And uh, I think some of the pictures are pretty good on, on seeing what you should see on this carcass should be um, just strictly blood. If there's any, any manure or any dirt or anything, I try to trim it off at, at the moment that it, that it hits the carcass. And uh, that way it, it, um, your end product is clean. I don't have to spend a lot of time trimming and, and, uh, wasting time trimming things that should have already been done. Where are you going, Roy? <laughs> Roy's traveling. I can see him. He's, he's driving around. So um, we're still on the siding process. Um, both sides, both, both bellies and both sides are skinned. And um, then uh, when the siding's finished, you can see uh, the one picture I'm opening up the brisket. And when we open up the brisket, we, we tie off the trachea so that when you're, when you're pulling the guts out, there's no, there's no spillage of manure or anything. You try to pull, pull that out, it's nice and clean. And uh, once again, you don't get any contamination. If you do, you wanna trim that um, at that point. Here's a, here's a look at the rack that's going on the tractor. You can, you can see it pushes me away from the, from the bucket, which saves a little bit of um, anything that's on the bucket that might fall off if the wind's blowing and, and something blows off the bucket, but that pushes me out away. Um, a good look at the, the stainless steel hooks and the chain. So then the chain just hooks right on the bucket uh, that gives you a really nice um, spread on your carcass. So when you're trying to split the carcass and um, made that, that was one thing that I really noticed with this rack going from the chains on the bucket to the, to the rack was I can split them a lot better now and, and it makes it a lot nicer when you're, when you got your carcasses hanging that you got a nice even split on them. So after the, after the siding, you do what we call the rumping process. You start the um, skinning of the rump, the rounds, and, and uh, basically you're taking the hide off of the, of the animal. You can see the kind of three stages there of, of um, finishing up. And then we jump into the gutting process. Um, back to the rumping process, when you open up the, the, the rear end, so we, we like to, in USDA plants, Try to try to make you do this, but you put a plastic bag on your hand, and then when you open that up, when you open up the the butt or the the rectum, you uh, pull it out with this plastic bag, and then you then you cover that with a plastic bag and tie it off. So then there can't be any um, manure or anything that that um, contaminates the inside of that carcass when you're where you're pulling the guts out. Uh, the, the trach will pull out because you've loosened it earlier and it will, it will pull out and everything comes out and there's no, there should be no contamination 
you you know you should be able to about be about 95 96 percent effective with with not breaking a gut or cutting a gut or breaking a a trach or any of that stuff so it, it ends up being nice and clean and uh, saves a lot of time on the trimming side so here's a here's a quick picture of uh, the start of the splitting process. Um, we have a uh, couple nice little saws that we bought with the mobile unit and uh, have one at my house also that um, makes life real easy. Um, it's, it's kind of a, just an upgrade from a well saw, but it's, um, I don't know, probably three or four minutes we can split a beef now. Whereas my little well saw probably took me about 10 minutes to do. So there's the, there's the end of the splitting process and um, do a little trimming here on the neck where you, where you stick the carcass and uh, clean it up a little bit. And then it's, it's uh, gets rinsed. And that's a, that's a pretty good look at the splitting job there and, and the, uh, the final product on a carcass. So Stacy and I talked about the takeaways and of course my biggest thing has always been cleanliness. I have friends that, that uh, will say, well, how long does it take you to skin a deer? And usually it's about twice as long as what they think they can do one end. But when we get done, the, the carcass is clean and there's no dirt, there's no hair, there's no, um, there's no outside contamination and uh, wanted to say that most of everything that my skills that I developed have been over years and years and, and I continue to try to new skills. I'm constantly trying a different approach on when, you know, how I, how I handle an animal, you know, when I'm skinning a, a lamb, I've, they've, they've gotten so strict with the USDA that, that I, I, every time I skin a lamb, I try something new to see if I can do it a little better to um, keep that keep that carcass clean and um, as as contaminated free as as they want because USDA is looking for a zero tolerance. They want they want nothing on that carcass before you put water on it. So so that's always my goal, whether I'm in a plant or under the bucket of a tractor. Uh, something we didn't talk about earlier is, or we did touch on earlier, is the health of the animal. They inspectors want animals to be healthy. They don't want to be um, sick or or dying or aging of you know something that wouldn't be good for human consumption. Um, of course, equipment. The better the equipment, the easier the process, and makes just makes life simple if you have better products, better. You know, my, my little rack, it, it was a simple idea and it'll go on just about any, any tractor bucket, but it really makes a difference on a couple parts of my process. And then, you know, don't rush the process, try to, try to do it right, keep it clean. You know, if it takes you an extra 30 minutes to keep it clean, that's, uh, that's time well spent. So hopefully all of you didn't fall asleep and that's the process of uh, a mobile slaughter. Maybe next so that, time, we, maybe next time we can do it in the trailer. Yes. Okay. We have one question so far um, from Justin. Did you consider any additional hazards, chemical, biological, physical, in your HACCP plan for skinning and splitting outside? Also, so did you address inclement weather in your plan? Yeah, so so I won't do if the wind's blowing, um, I won't even consider it. I've I've called customers before and said, hey, we're not we're not going today because the wind's blowing. And yes, anytime you've got weather, especially if you're under the bucket of a tractor, you know if it's raining and and the tractors the bucket's dirty, um, there's always going to be something that that's going to drip off. There there are no HACCP plans for. Um, custom exempt, you know, for mobile slaughter. 
they're, you know, we're not doing it under inspection. When we go in the trailer, then we will have a HACCP plan. And, and so that's just two different, two different worlds. Okay, next question is, do you have a video on this process? Or Stace, could we get one the next time he's doing it? We do not have a video, and I think we probably can do one. I know um, the guy that built the trailer would like a video to help to help um, promote his product if, if we get the trailer working, and, and especially if we get it USDA, because that'll be huge for him if we can get this trailer to pass USDA, because he's, he's about um, a third the cost of the other ones that are building them. So, so we, have, should, we should say when you get it passed. <laughs> Stacy will take some heads off if it doesn't get passed. I think the other thing is in the videos, one of my concerns with videos is not that we can't do it. We can definitely do it. But I don't want to think, I don't want to have that backyard person that is not you know, barely used to growing animals thinking they can slaughter something out by watching our video. So that's my biggest thing because I think, you know, we had the PPE little box up there and, you know, Charlie's butchered for years and those knives are sharp. I mean, you can kill yeah. yourself pretty easy by a slip of a knife. So those are the things that just concerns me, but I do think we'll have the capacity to do a video. Okay. I have a quick question. I, yep, I, right. I, was a little, I was a little confused, but so you guys, don't do any of the butchering as far as the butchering part inside the the mobile unit you only hang the carcass and process meat in there we haven't started in the mobile unit yet roy so oh. that's, okay. I, that's, where, that's where i got that's where i got off i apologize okay. yeah okay. So, when you so do that. when you do you will do all of it inside there won't you yes the the trailer so then you would be able to go out on a windy day and do whatever Yes, if we have the trailer going, yes, we can work on a windy day. Yeah. This, okay. This, okay. Little, this little custom side is just I stuff apologize. I've been doing on the side. Okay, another I question. Stacy was eating beef out of there already. No, but... I think Roy, Roy, we are deheading outside. So we oh, yeah. head outside and then we're all Yeah, I figured you'd have to do that. Okay, next question is from Clark. Um, hello, what is the size of the kit he built for the tractor? Oh, I just lost it. Another question. Um, for the tractor length, width, and what kind of hooks do you use? So, so the, the kit is just some uh, of the tractor forks that you can order off Amazon. And then I took it to a welding shop and had them weld some, some chain hooks on. And I believe I'm... I'm uh, you see that crossbar there and I think I believe that's 45 inches from outside to outside and then I put a another chain eye up close to the bucket for the first initial lifting of the carcass when you have both legs and you're lifting up um, and and the the hooks I just took some uh, regular rollers from from the slaughter plant that have stainless steel hooks on them and cut the roller off and put uh, put about, oh, maybe 24 inches of chain on there. And so my chain will just, just attach right to the, the uh, hook on the, on the fork. Okay, so the next we have another question is from Sean Realbird and I can answer this um, because we are actually having numerous people from um, our panel today do this. Um, it, the question is, do you think on a national perspective with the spread of COVID in the processing plants that Congress or state legislatures may fund or allocate funds to assist and support portable or facility processing plants owned by individuals or a tribe? So Sean and anyone else, um, in probably another six weeks, the Office of Tribal Relations is going to start hosting a lunch and learn. And one of their topics is this, however, theirs is going to be different. I do believe Stacy, Roy and Charlie are going to be on that, but the biggest thing that they are gonna discuss is funding options for this type of thing and um, the development of those funding options. So yes, this is definitely heading that way. 
Okay, what's our next question? We are at the end, so we can go back if you want. We can, um, just any questions you might have. I think the one thing to let everybody know is we're just gearing up for this. So as we go through our journey, we will probably be having different presentations and things available to you. And don't hesitate to reach out to us because right now, you know, Charlie showed the custom process on the farm. Um, once we start killing with the trailer, then we'll have that process too. So, and as we run into different things with USDA and not USDA and trying to get the custom exempt rules up for Nevada, there'll be different situations too. Um, there was also, before I open it up for questions again, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe is looking at a mobile slaughter or a plant, so they are working through the processes. I know they've ran into finding the resources to so the funding. I also know that the tribe in Bishop had ordered a mobile trailer with um, their CARES Act funds, and I'm not sure if they got it in yet, but they did contact us to assist them with workforce development training. Stacey, on the, we need for deciding on the size of trailer. And we, were you looking at the number of heads you could process in a week and as well as the road and the uh, capacity? What was your decision points on that? My decision points, which were blown all to heck, it tells you when you get on the ground floor and you start. I was looking at a trailer that we could pull with the Dodge Dooley and not with the semi. So the goals were, we're under 26,000 pounds. Um, we thought 30 feet was enough room. And then um, when we got to the regulations um, and it was just an oversight on the plans, we always expected to have that 11 feet inside. Um, you know, cause then you have the hooks hanging down and then you're what, 10 and a half at the hook level. So, and then Charlie and Hamilton had other things that they were looking at. So, so part of when Stacy and I started, um, we were looking at training um, on more of a custom level. And then NDA got involved with money and then we switched, they wanted USDA inspection. So our trailer is so big because we're looking to get the USDA inspection. You could build, you could build a much smaller trailer if you're looking to go on the custom level where you do the process outside and then you just hang them inside in a in your cooler space. Um, so so our, our trailer got much bigger when, when we swayed to uh, USDA um, to, to okay. do the process inside. Yeah, that's okay, what, so that's, that was what Roy was talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a great segue for our next question. Is the trailer equipped for cutting and wrapping? It is That's not. What I was it is not. So you'll have another asset plan to go from your trailer into wherever you're going to process it. Um, or is it going to be part of the same? No, I think the only thing so far that's hit us is that the carcasses have to be weighed. And we did not put a scale in our trailer. So, oh. so USDA FSIS said they will assist us and handling that process and coming up with that process, but they haven't mentioned a different asset. They may want something added to our HACCP and we're hoping yeah. that the main processor that we work with has a scale as they're brought in. You know, you can go, uh, there's some pretty reasonably priced things out there that you can do for a scale weight that it, USDA will accept. You know, it's just on your rail, it's just wherever your rail is. It's right. Like how long will you hang it for? Or how long will you store each carcass? That has to be determined. What do we have to, we have to bring that We're, carcass weight to 49 degrees within 24 hours, right? Temperature has to be the 49 degrees in 24 hours. We're hoping not to hang them very long in our trailer. Um, but the, the facility, we have, we have plants here now that are hanging for two days and then cutting and wrapping them. Um, okay. I, 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 can, I can answer some of that too. That's, yeah, right, uh, please. On that, uh, we used to do, because uh, everybody wants to hang everything for 10 or 12 days and it's really hard this day and age because everybody's so backed up. And if you, 
Trivac, you can age in the bag. It's oh. a, and it's actually a better age uh, from a profit standpoint because you got to remember when you're aging, those carcasses are shrinking and they're losing lots and lots of weight. So the, the Cryvac bag is the best way to age and, and keep some kind of fiscal plan involved. So you don't, you don't lose the weight in the bag? Well, you're going to pour some of it out eventually. But, uh, you know, because it's just going to be, but you're still not going to lose what you lose when it's just hanging there. Because when it's there, some of those places, uh, we used to sell some steaks to an outfit in uh, uh, Des Moines, Iowa. And it was a real high, and they, they had some racks in their cooler, and we would send the, the primal cuts to them. And then they would cut the primal cuts, and then they would hang them in there until green mold grew over them. And then they would trim that mold off. But. You know, they charged a lot for those, and they had to because they lost so much weight off that when they when they aged it like that. But it was really good. Now, yeah, so we have some concerns. I guess we haven't totally moved that way, and we want to do some research versus letting hang two to three days versus 10 to 12. And um, really see, our meat scientist is all about hanging two days and going in the package. But um, some of, I know some customers like that, that age yeah. and that hang. That's because, and it's, it's an old, it's an old process and so no one knows really about the cryback process. So it's about, uh, it's about re-educating everybody because a lot of people don't realize you can freeze, unfreeze and freeze something. You can even, we used to do it with USDA all the time because uh, it, it, all it does is stop the process when you freeze. So uh, a lot of folks, you know, I grew up, I grew up, my mom would never refreeze anything, you know, because they just weren't supposed to do that. But it, it, there's nothing wrong with doing that. So it's kind of the same concept, I guess. You just, you know, you got to kind of re-educate some of your clients into thinking that because it's going to make more so you can run more volume through your, you know, if you have to start making spaces, uh, hang stuff for three weeks, well, you're going to have a lot of critters hanging there or else you're not going to, you're, it's going to slow down your process. Right. Our issue is quality. Yes, absolutely. And that's, I'm going to tell you the cryback, quality. the cryback age is a very quality product it really is. We're not but in order to get yet. the, if you want to get the dry age, the dry, what'd you say? I said, we're not sold on that yet. We still want to <laughs> that. So on, well, you'll have I to dabble around the profitability it. side, I completely understand it. I don't know if I understand it on the quality of the product yet. I want to, I want to go through some research projects on that. So, so Roy, let me ask you this. How long are you wet aging the, the steak for in the, in the peg? Uh, some of them back in the day. Oh man, we'd age those for two weeks in there. And what it is, it's more like soaking them in a brine. I, I, you know, I don't want to gross anybody out because that's really what it is. The flavor is what's coming out of the meat, you know, so it's setting there in it. And it's uh, because the problem is, I know you have to leave them hang depending on how critical you're going to get your carcasses down. We used to have to get them down to 36 degrees in 24 hours to process but we could process next day. And then we'd put them in the cryback bag. And then we had a trailer that was just a cooler. We would put them on that trailer and we would, we would age in the cryback. And then we had a freezer where we went with everything else. But okay. you, you, can, you can age up to a month in there. I can't remember, I, cause I had to go, I had to, I had to go find the, the research and argue with uh, USDA, but we, we got it, we had it, so you could, it was a long time. Okay, Roy, a question for you. What is the two-day hang versus the 10-day hang versus the 30-day hang? It's just the age of the meat. It, uh, the the two-day hang is possibly, depending on what kind of critter it is, on how tough it's going to be, it could add some toughness to the meat, and just probably more certain cuts. And uh, 10 day, you got a you got a larger breakdown of the tissue, so it's going to be more tender, and so on and so forth. You know, I mean, you can age that until I'm not kidding you, until green mold grows on it, and you can age it past that. But you have to trim that off, and then they trim that off, and that I'm not kidding you, 
you can almost eat it with a plastic spoon when they get it cooked up. But that, that's the deal. So I find, so Stace, didn't you have doing your cattlemen's, you had a speaker speaking to the aging process? We did, and it's our meat scientist and he likes the two to three day hang and then processing, um, vacuum, pack, vacuum packing it. But we are finding that in the customs, specifically with the high-end animals like the Wagyu and stuff, they want that hang, that 10-day hang. So, you know, whether that's an education issue, whether yeah. or not, I mean, it's preference right now. I think, yeah. I, like, I personally would like to be involved in some research other than just being told that's how to do it. Yeah. I was on, I was on the South Dakota uh, certified board and we had us uh sdsu was doing a lot of, we they were actually some on some of their studies that uh freezing the meat when they first started the process of freezing it it actually accelerated some of the breakdown and uh so you know that i don't know where you would go to find that information but i know they did a lot of testing for us on so like age it frozen yeah, well, it just, it sped up the process in the beginning, and then when it come to an uh, end and was frozen, then it stopped the process. But oh, okay. you could also, one of the other things that they did was they took it out of the freezer, and then they aged it some more, and then put it back in the freezer. And it was amazing what they were doing. It was, it was but the, then I don't, I can't remember what happened to South Dakota Certified, but uh Anyway, uh, I think I'm sure they've still got that data on record somewhere. It, it was really interesting stuff they were doing. And Felix just said Native American beef does a 30 day hang. Yeah. Well, and you, you look back, you look back in history, man, some of our great, some of our ancestors hung meat in a tree for however long and ate on it for a long time yeah you know and uh they they were they stayed long enough to get us <laughs> so <laughs> um justin just said i would encourage you oh wow justin why don't you just unmute and tell me this <laughs> so everyone can hear it There so we go. Hey, Justin, uh, thanks. I encourage you to consider your E. coli carcass swabs when you're going under inspection. Those are required starting on June 1st. And the longer that meat hangs, uh, you're gonna see a reduction in the load and the less likelihood of a positive. So that's just from a regulatory standpoint. Nice, and Stace, that's in the chat. So I'll make sure you get that, yeah. you yeah. where that is. And that reference is nine CFR. So the Code of Federal Regulations 310.25. Uh, somebody says it's culture. <laughs> <laughs> Felix. That's, funny. That's true. <laughs> yes. Okay. Any other questions? We're getting, we're a minute away from my time allotment, but if we have more questions, we are all willing to stay longer. We just want to make sure we get as much as possible. I do want you guys to know that Stacy and I have discussed doing more than one of these especially as their um, efforts continue with their new mobile slaughtering facility or yeah, um, trailer. And, um, you know, there is a lot of interest. This has been a great turnout and really great questions. Um, one of the things I'm going to do when we're done is- I want to answer every... one of Charlie's questions. Yes. I forgot that. I forgot to follow up. So like when we did that Trivac bag, and we, I think it was three weeks that we were allowed to age it. And then when we got to the three week end, we froze it. So, and you got to remember all uh, foodborne pathogens are, are born on the outside of the product also. So, you know, you just trim that off. And then if you cook it hot enough, it'll always kill it. So. Okay, thanks, Ray. Yeah, no, we, we always, I just, Grew up in, in 14 days was the rule. And, you know, occasionally you get the request for oh, 21, 28. And yeah, me too. I just, 
I'm just so floored that we can refreeze stuff. So <laughs> I'm old school too. <laughs> All our moms are like, no, you cannot. So that's been my takeaway today, <laughs> among many, many other things. If you want my opinion, you, know, on the you gotta learn, you gotta do a lot of stuff you don't like to do. <laughs> if you want What's my your... opinion on, on refreezing, um, absolutely you could refreeze it, but I think every time we freeze something, we do take a little bit of the flavor away. And I don't uh, know, I don't know why, but you take a fresh package of sausage right when you grind it and you go cook it. And it's awesome. And then three weeks later, it's still good. And a month and a half later, it's still good. But four months later, it's not quite as good. But I, I think refreezing, we lose a little bit um, each time. I think you're yeah. right. That's just that makes opinion. sense. It makes me not want to buy a whole beef at a time and stick it in my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you keep it frozen, you have whatever flavors there frozen in. So oh, okay. It comes out. You see what I'm saying? So then, but if you refreeze it, you're going to lose some of it. Okay. Awesome. I gotcha. I mean, that's, yeah. All right, guys. Any other questions? Nice. Nice job. I want to thank our panel for being on and all the work they put into the presentations and the time today for all of our participants. I will follow up with getting everyone information um, that will not be until tomorrow or Friday. I have something going on, um, but we will make sure everyone has access to the slide decks as well as Roy's Excel spreadsheets. If there's nothing else, I want everyone to have a wonderful day. And again, thank you so much for all the questions and participation. And yep, I was just double checking. I'm gonna save our chat so we can get this out as well. And I thank think, you. I think the other thing, if there are requests for specific type, like we didn't go into a lot of processing today. Yeah. Right. I mean, if those are things that we do need to put together, just let us know. Cause I mean, you can do two hours on specific parts. Yes, guys, I forgot my poll. Don't get off yet. I have one more poll. Stop, stop. Everyone's getting up. All I've done for a year is take polls. Oh my gosh, I lost five of them. All right, all right, guys, take the poll. I need, I need feedback. So, so sorry. I am not used to the polls. Okay. Um, no, they're still on. Oh, they're still on. But they're every time. Wow, great. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>